Now, I will briefly introduce these 13 classic principles of multimedia learning. These 13 classic principles are about how to design instructional materials and environment according to how people learn from words and pictures. Multimedia principle. The basic idea behind the multimedia principle is that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. You often need to use both words and pictures to communicate your ideas. Here's a short video clip by a pro bodybuilder, Ben Pukowski. I removed the video track from the clip so you only hear his verbal explanations. Okay, let's show you what a fully shortened lat looks like doing a one-arm dumbbell row. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't do. The first impor most important thing you need to do is ensure balance. So what Maria is doing is putting a lot of weight on this leg and a lot of weight on this arm and very little weight on this leg. The reason being we want to shift the, the emphasis so that there's a lot of weight supported here. So you get a maximum stretch of the shoulder without letting her torso twist. The first thing she's going to do is depress her shoulder and now retract and pull. Perfect. So that lat gets really, really short. Letting the elbow come too far out from the body is going to prevent the lat from getting short. Good. All the way up. You're trying to aim your wrist at your hip. So try to get your, your wrist to right there. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Right there. Exactly. Without allowing your body to rotate. So the first thing is depress that shoulder. And now, good. And now row it. Hold. Good. So we're getting that lat really short. Big stretch of the lat. We lengthen it fully. And then we shorten it fully. I don't think you were able to understand all the details accurately unless you are a bodybuilding expert. Now here's another video clip by Ben Pukowski. I muted the sound so you won't hear his explanation this time. He gave some very important tips in the video. Did you get them? Probably not. I don't think you were able to extract even half of what he was trying to teach in this clip. Okay, I want you to watch it again, but I will turn on the audio track this time. So what a lot of people do, they curl it, their arm ends up looking like this. So, not a lot of, not a lot of supination of the arm. What you really need to focus on is making sure that you're turning that dumbbell at the top. I'm all, when I'm doing it, I'm literally trying to squeeze my baby finger on that dumbbell and turn it to the point that I can't really turn it anymore. I come down, I pronate. I come up, I supinate. I pronate. Look at, notice how nothing's happening in my arm. Notice there's nothing happening up here. The only movement is happening here. So if I were to do it without a dumbbell, it literally just look like this. So now everything should be clear. The point is that in most instructional scenarios, you need both words and pictures to communicate things fully and completely. Redundancy principle. Earlier, we learned that in many cases, words alone or pictures alone could only partially communicate the important details. But by combining both words and pictures, all the important details were communicated. In that scenario, like spoken words needed pictures to be complete, and pictures needed words to be complete. Now we have a complete picture and complete instruction. Can you make it better by adding more words or pictures to it? For example, what if you added written words to it as an alternative source of information? Now your audience have got pictures and have options to attend to spoken words, written text, or both. Would it make your teaching better? Hell no! That can actually depress students' learning. Adding the same information in the name of extra or alternative is redundant and unnecessary. It should be avoided. So this leads to the next principle. Coherence principle. So we already know that redundant information is bad and should be avoided. But what's even worse is irrelevant information that is the information that's not relevant to the idea you're trying to communicate at the moment. 
Your brain processes everything that enters your eyes and ears, whether you are aware of it or not. So, if your presentation contains some irrelevant materials, your brain is going to process those irrelevant materials, leaving less room for the materials that are actually important. You might be surprised to know that you should not use a pretty background like this in PowerPoint, or not even this. You might be surprised to know that you should not use images with background that don't match the background of the slide. You might also be surprised to know that you should not listen to a song while working on the mentally demanding tasks. So when you teach, you should try to eliminate all the irrelevant materials from your instructional materials and environment. But what if you can eliminate some or many of the irrelevant materials? This leads to the next principle. Signaling and queuing principle. The idea behind the signaling and queuing principle is that if you can't eliminate the irrelevant information from, from your material, emphasize what's important. You can do that verbally or graphically. For technicality, by signaling, we mean verbal emphasis. And by queuing, we mean graphic emphasis. So when I said, hell no, that was my signaling technique to emphasize the idea I was trying to teach. Simply stressing key terms or important phrases is also a signaling technique. In a written text, using bold or italic face is also a signaling technique. Some of the techniques of queuing include highlighting an important part with a circle, arrow, underline, spotlight effect, and zoom in effect. Spatial Contiguity Principle The basic idea behind Spatial Contiguity Principle is that when you present two things that are closely related to each other, put them together rather than far away from each other. In this example, you can easily tell UNL had 200 students from Southeast Asia back in 2011 and 189 students from Central Asia. Now look at this example. I found this on the UNL website a while back. Tell me how many international students were from Middle East. Okay, now how many students were from Europe? Which design was easier to process or interact with? I'm sure it was this one. Okay, let's call them a good example and bad example. With a good example, search and find was easy and instantaneous. Where with a bad example, you have to try much harder to search and find relevant information. With a good example, it's more likely that you will actually remember the information in pair of a student number and the world region. This effect is called sensory integration or sensory convergence. If we look at two or more things together at the same time, our brains tend to store them as a bundle. So when we try to recall them later, we recall them all together. But with a bad example, we are forced to look at one thing at a time. So we can't take advantage of the sensory convergence in this case. Temporal Contiguity Principle This is kind of similar to the Spatial Contiguity Principle. Spatial Contiguity Principle mainly concerned with the distance or spatial gaps. But Temporal Contiguity Principle concerns with timing or temporal gaps. Still the same ideas of the split attention effect and sensory convergence apply here. Let me show you an example of creating a temporal gap. Let's talk about the four spheres of the Earth. This is called atmosphere, this is lithosphere, this is hydrosphere, and this is called biosphere. Now look at this slide. As you've just seen, atmosphere is layers of gases surrounding the Earth. Lithosphere is the Earth's crust. Hydrosphere is any form of water. And biosphere refers to things that are living or alive a short time ago or are derived from living organisms. In this example, the diagram and the explanations were presented successively one after another instead of together. You are forced to hold this image in your mind while attending to this information, or hold this information in mind while looking at this picture. This act of mentally holding information is called representational holding and it's cognitively demanding and interferes with the deeper learning of the material being taught. 
Also, the fact I didn't present those two items within the same time frame made it less likely for sensory convergence to occur. Making proper association is a large part of learning. If you want your students to make a strong association between two related things, present them within the same time frame. Modality principle. Remember the earlier example. We needed both words and pictures to fully communicate the idea. So this is a picture part. Now we have two options for words. Should we use spoken words or written words? Let's watch the written words version first. Now let's watch the spoken words version. First, you square this number here and you get 1. The next, you calculate the product of the three numbers. So in this case, you have to do 2 times 2 times 1 and you get 4. And finally, you square this number here and you get 4. What do you know? You have 144. Which was easier for you? I bet the spoken version was easier. But why? This is a picture of human information processing architecture. We had the visual channel to perceive visual information and the auditory channel to perceive auditory information. When you watch the written words version, both pictures and words were handled by your visual channel because both were visual information. Uh, when you watch the spoken words version, only pictures were perceived through your visual channel, and spoken words were, of course, perceived through your auditory channel. Our brains can operate both visual and auditory channels simultaneously. It's an automatic process. We don't even have to try to do it. Our brains just do that effortlessly. So in the spoken words version, you are able to encode both pictures and words at the same time quite effortlessly. On the other hand, with the written words version, you have to work your visual channel maybe two times harder to encode both pictures and words, which of course makes learning harder. Segmenting principle. When we try to understand a complex concept or system, and also when we try to perform a complex skill or technique for the first time, we usually can't quite grasp the whole concept, system, or skill. It's because the human brain is somewhat limited in terms of how fast it operates, how soon sensory information would decay, and how much information you can hold in your working memory at any given moment. The point is that a complex system or process has high element interactivity, meaning many things taking place at the same time and interact as a whole system and your brain often cannot process all the interacting elements at the same time. So a solution to that is breaking it apart to smaller and manageable parts and pieces and study one part at a time. This leads to the next principle. Three training principle. According to the segmenting principle, if you need to understand something with high element interactivity, segmenting it into smaller parts and studying one part at a time is a way to go. A question still remains, which part should you study first? In many cases, smaller and simpler systems or processes combine together and create more complex systems or processes. And those slightly more complex systems or processes combine together to create a whole system of process which is highly complex. So complex systems or processes usually have a pyramid or a cascading structure. To understand a more complex system, you must start with its foundational components or building blocks. Personalization principle. So far, I've been discussing ways to eliminate or reduce distracting elements from your instructional materials or environment and ways to emphasize important and relevant information. All those efforts will be wasted if your students don't engage in active learning. 
One way to promote active learning and learner engagement among your students is to stimulate social responses from your students by tapping into social aspects while you teach. One way to stimulate social responses is to use a personable teaching style. In most cases, using a conversational style or tone tends to promote learner engagement. For example, here's a simple statement. One plus one can be three. This is not quite a conversational style. Conversational style and tone can be as simple as presenting it in a form of question like, Did you know that one plus one can be three? Using the words like you, we, I can also add conversational touch to your presentations. Here's a very interesting snippet from a movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone anyone the great depression passed the anyone anyone a tariff bill the holly smoot tariff act which anyone raised or lowered raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government did it work anyone anyone know the effect in this video, the teacher uses questions, but he violates the personalization principle really bad by using a flat, indifferent tone. Voice principle. Another way to promote active learning and learner engagement through stimulating social responses is to speak naturally with a good tempo. Actually, what sounds natural depends on who the learner is, since most of you speak and are used to English with a U.S. accent. The English with the U.S. accent will probably sound most natural and comfortable to you. Some people may actually like certain foreign accents a lot, but research suggests that heavy and thick foreign accent like this. I'm going to compare two memory cards. First one is the SanDisk Ultra and the second one is the Samsung Evo. Both the memory cards are 16 GB class 10 and both claim to have 48 Mbps of speed as you can see over here. But buying a memory card is pretty tough sometimes. A machine voice like this. Hi, this is to test the text-to-speech software. I am going to sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wondered what you are up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Tend to depress learning and learner engagement. Embodiment principle. Another way to promote active learning and learner engagement through the social response effect is using gestures and facial expressions. Facial expressions and gestures are not just for stimulating social responses. Watch this video snippet of me talking. They are absolutely horrible. I'm sure I made the point strong and clear. My facial expression emphasized how horrible they are. So facial expressions can work as important visual cues to emphasize or supplement what you're saying. Now watch this video snippet. We found that 88% of drivers are more likely to take notice of an LED billboard. And the best part? 92% of them retain the information they see on the billboard when they're in stop and go traffic. Traffic map of Interstate 94. We've positioned billboards here and here I, for one, suddenly love traffic. I don't know about you. Gestures, especially pointing at important parts of your presentation, can also serve as visual cues. This leads to the next principle. Image principle. This mostly applies to multimedia presentations like video lessons and tutorials. So let me ask you a question. When you create a video lessons or tutorials, is it always a good idea for you to show yourself in a video like this? With 300 million people in America. Or like this? On their tablet devices, go ahead and use... Or like this? The answer is, hell no! There are only a couple of occasions or ways you should show yourself as a presenter in your video. One occasion is when you have absolutely no visuals to show that pertain to the lesson content you are presenting. If you've got nothing helpful to show, should you just show nothing? Hell no! Show yourself and tap into the social response from your audience. Another occasion or way to show yourself as a presenter in your video is when you use a pointing gesture to point out important parts of the screen just like this video snippet.
This type of pointing or visual cue can often be more effective than simple circles and arrows. With a depth sense in 3D webcam and an app like Personify, adding yourself to a video like this can be quite easy. So that's it. I've covered all 13 classic principles of multimedia learning. For more information about individual principles, watch separate videos I've created.